kick off. And I want to welcome everyone to this uh, session. And this is a session uh, on capacity building. And the session itself is capacity building for safe and secure cyberspace, making it real. So that's the bit there. I think that word real, you can actually put it in capital. We need to make it real. So welcome again to this particular session. And uh, we have a one hour session of this particular topic uh, with me. Uh, just before I introduce the participants, we do have online participants and of course on-site on -site participants uh, who are here in terms of the panelists. And uh, we also have our moderator, uh, that is Kathleen Behe, uh, who will make uh, sure that we collect all the information and inputs that you will provide. Uh, we also want you to be interactive. So at any point, if there are any issues or you have a question, we'll give you, we'll give you ample time to be able to ask your questions. So with the panel, it's a very cross-cutting panel. Uh, first of all, we do have uh, Sylvia. Uh, Kadena, uh, who is actually head of uh, programs and partnerships at APNIC Foundation. Uh, Sylvia, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, and we also have on my left, we have Jacqueline Pateguana, who is the clearinghouse coordinator at the GFCE. Welcome. And then we also have Kerry Ann Barrett, uh, who is the cybersecurity program manager with OIS. Welcome. Okay, I think you're muted there. And then we also have uh, Kaja uh, Siglik, who is actually with Microsoft. Welcome. Thank you. And then of course, lastly, but not least, is my very good colleague, Andrea Calderaro from European Institute. And we just met last week. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So with that uh, said, and of course the panelists, as we said, will give you time, uh, given that this is a World Cup season, I do have a red card and a yellow card, just in case you take too much time. So uh, without wasting any time, the objective is to mainly explore uh, some of the regional dynamics. As we all know, it is important that we are able to assess the cyber capacity building, especially at regional level, in order to know what are the discourse, especially when it comes to capacity building. There are various factors that do affect regional dynamics. We know countries do have different issues, regions do have different issues, and it's important for us to understand what culminates to those issues and how we can be able to resolve that. So if you look at the speakers, they come from across the globe. They've got various experiences and varied experiences uh, from working with them in some specific areas. I'm sure you'll all benefit from their intellectual input. And the plan for the panel, and as I said earlier, is to be very, very interactive, and hopefully we should be able to cover this in good time. So just to kick off, uh, we do have at least three to five minutes for each of the panelists, and I'll start with you, Sylvia. Um, your organization is very prominent in the region, in Asia Pacific, and I'm sure with the challenges that are in that particular region, uh, of course, there are so many other experiences that you have within the region, so while you are very well familiar with the global discussion on capacity building. What would you put uh, or rather point out as specific challenges for Asia and the Pacific region? Sylvia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that everybody can hear me. Um, APNIC is the Asia Pacific Network Information Center and we allocate the IP addresses and ASN numbers that all the network operators in the Asia Pacific require to connect their customers to the internet. We've been around for around 30 years, and um, in, since our beginning, uh, capacity building is a part of the core of the DNA of uh, APNIC. Uh, the foundation was established um, in, back in 2017, with the idea of uh, expanding the footprint uh, of the capacity building efforts and community building efforts that APNIC uh, conducts both at the regional and global level. As such, um, you know, besides the sheer um, increase in the in growth in the in the uh, number of users and the number of networks that exist in the region that are um, 
and the demand uh, of the internet, not only because of COVID and during COVID and now after COVID or during, are we still enduring? Um, uh, is is this this need of um, uh, incorporate the internet infrastructure as part of the development services and access for citizens around the region, and that means that um, the the twenty four seven um, reliable, accessible, affordable, stable etc that the internet needs to be uh, is gaining um, more and more uh, pressure uh, from the network operators that are working very hard to maintain um, and operate uh, those networks in a stable and secure uh, manner um, so that is the the, the sheer growth uh, is, is a biggest you know really really big challenge that in a region where multilingualism is uh, everywhere you look um, makes the maintenance and uh, the training and um, the, the design of um, manuals, guides, uh, and other techniques to be able to follow best practice. Um, it is a massive challenge because the technology continuously uh, continues to develop. And um, it's very difficult for in many countries where English is not um, the main language to maintain the level of engagement with a rapid um, um, change in the, especially the maintenance of uh, security uh, considerations around network operations. Um, and then um, thirdly, um, the I think that probably one of the things that has changed very dramatically in the last few years and maybe my colleagues in other regions uh, could share a little bit of, of their experience is that the reliance in terms of livelihoods and the delivery of government services especially during the pandemic has also meant that uh, something that was um, very useful and uh, you know very important especially in the cities in ac across the region became um, a, a much more critical resource for organizations and, and, and businesses that were in uh, more uh, remote areas where probably the infrastructure was not up to the uh, expectations to to be able to to cope with that um, with the growth and, and the needs of the community and if you add to that the number of people um, in asia pacific that move from uh, city centers to work remotely in areas where they were able to live a life a little bit more uh, freely outside of uh, lockdowns that also uh, created additional uh, challenges. So I, I would leave it at that. And I will pass on to um, the other panelists um, to see uh, what their experiences are. Yeah, Thank but Silvia, just before you, you go, um, yeah. I know you've ch touched about the need for infrastructure and you talked about the challenges especially post covid challenges or during covid which is understandable uh, could you just comment briefly on the issues around i know you touched it a bit lack of experience and also the brain drain issue could you just touch on that does it affect the region quite a bit in terms of getting the expertise that you need uh, in the region uh, absolutely um I think that one one of the most important um, things that I have learned in my 15 years living in, in Australia is um, I'm, I'm originally from Colombia, so I, I don't know what they would say of the fact that I left. So if that is brain drain or or brain contributions in another part of the world, I don't I don't know exactly how that works, but. Um, I think that one of the, the issues in, in regards to uh, immigration and um, development of capacity is that that the fact that someone leaves their country, um, it doesn't mean that they are never going to return. And I think that that is something uh, very special and very particular, so that especially in the, in the Pacific um, Islands, um, where there are a number of investments from, especially from governments that have uh, uh, supported um, high level education and are quite uh, concerned of the fact that 
people go to do their university studies or, you know, masters, PhDs, what have you. And then they seem to believe that there is that that talent goes and never returns. And I think that what I have seen in, in the Pacific is that people do return and they return because they want to stay closer to family, to their traditions and to their own culture at some point in their career. And that one of the issues that are uh, super important to continue to develop is the pipeline to be able to attract that talent again, um, either through making sure that they can bring their pensions back in so that they can afford to, to live in, in the places where they uh, originally came uh, from um, or that they can, you know, um, slowly uh, move to new and other jobs and create jobs that, that that will be attractive for people to come back and i, I think those pathways are still uh, to be uh, uh, solved but very recently uh, one government official uh, from png that was visiting us uh, tell us tell, tell something uh, very interesting in a conversation where he said you know we, we just need to stop um saying to to people that if you train them, they are going to leave. You know, just you need to invest in them. Otherwise, no, nothing is is going to to change. So I I think that we need to stop being afraid of who's going to leave and just make things attractive for people to come back and for other people like myself that migrated from other part of the world to serve a need um, in the um, economy where I live. Yeah. Um, I I hope that I addressed uh, your questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, and uh, we really want to. Thank you for being awake at this particular point, point, I mean point in time. So moving on, um, I want to go to the OAS. And uh, kerri I know recently the GFCE and the Latin American and the Caribbean have organized a regional meeting, uh, which gave us more inputs on priorities of the region in cyber capacity building. Um, so Kerry, could you just uh, give us some of the specifics of that particular meeting. Um, I know this is one of your domains and you're doing quite a lot of good work in that region. Uh, Kerry, the floor is yours. Thank you so much and to the GFCE for organizing this session. Um, I think I wanted to probably offer two perspectives, one from the meeting and then to just give some quick highlights from a report that we recently published with Cisco on workforce development. Mm -hmm. And it was particularly geared towards identifying those gaps. So for those who may not know who are in the session, the OAS Sick Day Cybersecurity Program is the focal point for the GFCE Hub for the Americas. And in that capacity, we organized the GFCE Regional Meeting for the Americas a few weeks ago. A part of that session focused on us bringing together member states from across the region. And during the session, we presented the priorities for the GFCE coming out of the annual meeting and what the GFCE does generally, including the clearinghouse. And we challenged our member states to actually identify some of the needs. Um, some interesting topics came out. Um, member states did recognize more specifically that there is a gap between the decision makers and the technical persons. And the perspective that they provided was kind of unique because they identified that it's not so much that it's the technical lingo that's the gap, but in as much as a lot of the decision makers are at the aging population and they can't identify with the information that's needed to make the decision. So oftentimes when they do present some of the technical challenges, some of their bosses, they don't even use a computer as often as they should. So the, the language is one challenge, but actually identifying the challenges for their bosses to be educated on why what they do is important and how it impacts the organization. Um, another need that was identified um, during the session for our region was that there wasn't sufficient offerings on education concerning digital skills gap generally. So cybersecurity being one thing, but recognizing a lot of the degrees that came out of the universities weren't matching the skills needed for the employers when they go into the actual jobs. So more generally, capacity building came out as a very strong theme. And one of the things that we identified um, as the hub is that as we continue to identify the needs for the region, we're thinking to do maybe a biannual call to our member states for them to actually flag the growing needs. Because while this year the challenges might be the need for certain digital skills, we recognize that as we work with the GFCE, the goal would be to continually have a 
rolling list of needs as they evolve. Um, I also wanted to just take the quick opportunity to flag that we published a report that actually did a desk research on workforce development um, in cybersecurity and the scarcity of talents and skills. Um, that's the English translation right now. It's only in Spanish, but we will be translating it in English. And one of the priority areas that came out of that report was recognizing that there is an aging population in the region now. It didn't just affect the globe, but it affected the Americas where persons are now resigning because they recognize that there's a need to rethink what they do and to actually leave their jobs to find something more fulfilling. So even when we had a big skills gap in digital skills because of the evolving technology, there's even now a greater gap. As Sylvia said, she's she's off to another place. The persons are actually looking outside of the region as well to find better jobs in industries that may be more interesting for them. Another thing that we noticed um, coming out of that research for our region is that the pandemic reversed some of the gender parity we actually had that was increasing in the workplace. So while we started to see more women taking on roles in digital and cybersecurity, we're now seeing a reversal in that. And because of that reversal, we're now faced with a context in the Americas where we have to be now focused on more concrete national strategies and policies geared towards including women again into the narrative of employment. Um, another thing that we saw was that there was a disparity between the off and demand in our region in the Americas, where you would have the job offers being composed of those who are just recent graduates, and then you have the sector looking for persons with experience. So while we're encouraging so many students to go into cybersecurity and get their skills, when they actually go out to the job market, they don't have the technical background experience that the job market is requiring. So there's a big gap in the Americas for that as well. And I think the final thing I wanted to highlight is that there's a lot of non-STEM first graduate um, routes that students are taking. So there's still persons going into non-STEM jobs. So when they actually try to do a career change, figuring out what certification they need to pivot from having a degree in law to now doing something that is more related to cybersecurity policy, there's not a lot of guidance on that. So I think in short, um, referencing the annual meeting, what we were happy with is that the needs identified during that meeting matched up with the research that we've done. I don't know if you have another question, but I'll pause there just yeah. to see. Yeah, yeah thank you very much, uh, kerri uh, She raises quite a number of issues, but what catches me particularly is the issue around the mismatch between the information uh, from decision makers and also from the, tech, you know, the technical teams. Um, in some regions, you'd find that that mismatch is always the language that is used. And I don't know whether that is the same experience that some of you in the, in, the, I mean in the room have seen, whereby technical people do not necessarily understand what the politicians and decision makers want. In many cases, they would talk about money and elections. That's what they want to hear. But sometimes we talk about money, the middle attack, and so forth, so it becomes lost in translation. But Kerry, just before we leave you to go, uh, in terms of just to pause a bit, um, are there any issues to do with duplication of effort, for example? Because we've seen that that many of these development uh, programs, you have issues on uh, duplication, duplicity of work and also wastage of resources. Is that something that you've experienced in the region during your study and during this particular meeting? I think one of the things that came out clearly from the member states during the meeting is that there is an increased interest by implementers and donors to provide technical capacity to the Americas. So one of the things that we saw as a positive, and if you've kind of flipped duplication, is that we have offers, we have interest in the region to actually build capacity. One of the things that we're hoping to do, member states did identify that sometimes many offers come at the same time from multiple persons and multiple donors about, for example, establishing a cert. So one of the things that we've been focused on with our member states is to start to think about there are different offers that could come, but you could take them at different stages of development of what you're doing. So even as the GFC hub in the Americas, we've had last year something that was called a donors and implementers meeting, where we actually had a virtual roundtable of various donors and implementers to start mapping 
some of the activities that they were doing and to just have a dialogue. And we're hoping this will be an annual thing for the Americas. We also worked really closely with Rob and um, our GFC liaison, Valentina, to update the civil portal to start to map some of the different projects that are in the Americas. So in short, there is some amount of duplication, but personally, this is just me flipping my head just to give a personal perspective on it. It's an opportunity and not a challenge, because what it means is that we can start to redirect the funds where, where we might say we're doing cert development, you may be able to redirect. If I have cert in my project and five other people have it, we can then say one person is focused on this skill set for this cert. The next person could be focused on the provision of equipment. The third person can actually be focused on building out subscriptions for them for the next two years or having a training program for the cert so while some persons see it as a challenge i see it as an opportunity because we can genuinely look at seeing what the donors are bringing to the table and actually create a roadmap for the beneficiaries that are being offered this help so in short what we hope to do with working with the clearinghouse mechanism that the gfc will have and continuing to work with our donors and implementers is to actually start to coordinate and using our role as a GFC hub to start coordinating those efforts. One, the OES has our own cybersecurity program. That too has to be streamlined with what the IDB is doing, what LAC4 is doing, which is one of the implementers in the region now, World Bank and other donors that are there. But um, member states did identify it as a challenge, but for us, I think we could flip it to an opportunity. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Kerri uh, We really appreciate uh, that input. And just moving on, we've covered quite a bit of uh, the globe. So we've looked at the Asia Pacific, and we had uh, some insight that Sylvia gave. We've also gone to the OS um, work that is happening in the Latin America and the Caribbean region. Uh, and now we just want to focus again in line with what Kerry has just been alluding to in terms of the clearinghouse process in the GFCE. And on my left, of course, Jacqueline, your work with the GFCE, you've been looking at how you match requests from member states, especially in Africa, and looking at how they can get their support, either from implementing partners or development partners. Uh, could you just give us some of the burning needs that are happening, especially in the region, given post-COVID and the priorities that have changed? If you could just take that. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, First, let me start by contextualizing what the GFCE is. Uh, the GFCE is a, a platform for international collaboration, for reducing overlap, and for reducing duplication of efforts in the cyber capacity building ecosystem. So what is that essentially means um, is that we work within a community of over 170 members and partners uh, coming from government, intergovernmental organizations, civil society, tech, academia. Um, and we are, our main mission is to push forward to ensure an open, secure, um, free internet. Uh, and we do this by A, identifying what the resources are um, and who, uh, and who has the expertise in cyber capacity building. And we've been doing this for the last seven years since found being founded in 2015. So very, um, I would say, young organization. Um, but for the last seven years, we have been working on the supply side of CCB, uh, which is, like I said, mapping who's who, what they're doing, and ensuring that those that are doing um, and are playing in this field are communicating with each other and are not uh, duplicating efforts um, uh, so that we can advance uh, the agenda, right, of making cyber resilience a, a reality for the globe. Uh, as a clearinghouse, uh, this is you know one of the three tools that we have within the GFCE. So the mapping is within Civil Portal, which I think Karianne referred to, and most uh, which Karianne referred to. Uh, you can see there in Civil Portal over 800 projects um, and over 750 resources. And resources we're talking about frameworks, uh, we're talking about best practices, we're talking about reports on projects. Uh, so you, if you want to be able to you know pinpoint what is going on. Uh, today, you have an open resource. This is a civil portal uh, that is constantly updated um, by the members of the GFCE community and others. 
Um, and then we have the clearinghouse, which is uh, uh, the tool that I am sitting with and I'm responsible for. Um, the clearinghouse is a mechanism that allows for GFC members to request support in terms of resources or expertise or, or knowledge um, from other GFCE members and partners. Um, so what we have seen um, is that many of the requests come from the Global South, obviously, and as Martin referred here, um, mostly from Africa. And we have African member, um, members of you know, the GFCE uh, requesting support in sometimes, you know, most times I would say, is orienting where to start the cyber journey um, and this is because many of the sub-regions within Africa are still underdeveloped in terms of cybersecurity. Um, I think North Africa, from the study that we recently did, uh, is the only one that is developing, uh, but East Africa, Southern Africa, West Africa, uh, Central Africa are underdeveloped in most of the areas that we look at, and we look at five areas, um, and we can get into it later. Um, so it is, it's really about starting the cyber journey and realizing that is, uh, there's a wealth of of ways to start and things to look at from take technical capabilities to policy to institutional frameworks. Um, so what do you attack first? What is the recommended um, best uh, practices from those that have done it within the community? Um, and the Clearinghouse is now in the process of facilitating these discussions in a south-to-south -south, um, context primarily. Um, but obviously we do have implementers and we do have funders and we do have um, other technical expertise that sometimes comes from outside of the global south as well. And so we tap into the resources that exist within the GFCE um, to make that come a reality for the requesting country. Um, to give a practical example, uh, currently we are working with one country who wants to, who f worked with us in 2019 um, for the drafting, developing of their national cybersecurity strategy. That was Sierra Leone. Um, so between 2019 and 2021, um, we've identified within the GFC community uh, funders and implementers, um, including um, consultants um, and development agencies um, that could support Sierra Leone with doing everything from assessment to developing um, a draft of uh, the actual strategy to socializing the strategy with uh, civil society, academia, tech community, et cetera, within country until finally it was taken uh, for approval from government. Today, Sierra Leone is back with the clearinghouse um, and we're working on the implementation of some of the key items of uh, the strategy, uh, including implementation of the CERT, uh, but then also developing cyber crime uh, capabilities um, and public outreach for society. They already have the legal framework for cyber crime, um, but now it is a question of a uh, informing um, society what is cyber crime why is this important why is it relevant what is within the scope of um, this you know this instrument the act uh, but then also creating capabilities within um, police and then uh, judiciary to be able to uh, tackle and uh, you know this, this, this rising issue that they're having so I'll stop there yeah, thanks so much for that insight. And I think for those of you who are wondering the, C the, the, the sort of the civil portal, uh, it's a quite quite an elaborate portal. It's got quite a lot of details there. You've got roughly about thirteen thousand unique users. You've got roughly about eight hundred and twenty projects that have been listed out there, and roughly about two hundred and ninety-seven tools and other information that you can gather from that civil portal. So I actually seen that. But just before you relax a little bit, I just wanted to find out. In the clearinghouse, I know y you've been there not more than a year, but I think you're getting there. So the point is that in the clearinghouse, are you seeing more of the request from specific a aspects in terms of whether is it the search that are being asked for, or is it just capacity building per se, or is it uh, strategies? Which what's, what's, what's the sort of like the, the the areas that you're seeing most countries asking for? Okay, so I think within the clearinghouse, um, because 
the, the needs have to be very clearly specified so that we know how to best address and we can be concise in developing projects and uh, mobilizing resources and expertise. We see, like I said, you know, it is really beginning of the journey of a cyber capacity building. Uh, so usually countries are looking to define what their objectives are uh, and what the roadmap is going to be for the next few years. Um, and part of that process, I want to say that while a strategy may be the, the deliverable that is you know, given with, you know, within so many months, um, part of the issue that we're hearing, and especially from the community that we have created within Africa, um, is that there is a need to sensitize um, and to get political endorsement for cyber. So yes, you may have a department within a ministry that's responsible for it, um, but it's not clearly defined, you know, what they're going to do, what the resource are, see resources that they have are, and then what are the deli deliverables that they have to give on an annual basis. And so when those same um, experts or, you know, the people who've been assigned to cyber come to us, they want to be able to sit down with society um, and stakeholders that are relevant to define what is our roadmap, where, are we, where do we want to go? Um, and once they have defined that roadmap, then the implementation begins on that. So it is, I would say, you know, political endorsement would definitely be one, and willingness, um, buying that or getting that willingness from governments to see cybersecurity as a as a priority item. Um, recently, we just two days ago we had a meeting with uh, the Africa Regional stakeholders, the GFC Africa regional um, stakeholders. Uh, the second one was also revision of legal frameworks. So eventually, you know, it goes it goes in, t in, in phases um, in terms of getting the buy-in and then starting to develop uh, the technical and institutional capabilities uh, that are necessary to address what has been agreed at the, you know, top level with government. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that insight and for any other information on Clearinghouse. I think most of the people here can come to you. Um, there is no way we can have development without partners, and in fact, resources is critical. So therefore, if you have resources, finances, and having partners, that's how we can be able to develop uh, capacity. So moving on, uh, Kaya, um, I just wanted to you to give us uh, further specific role of how the private sector in cyber capacity building and then if you can move just beyond that and how do you view the private sector in providing financial resources? Kaya, over to you. Um, sure, um, thank you. I, I don't, uh, maybe I'll start, uh, maybe I'll actually start with, Sil with some of like responding to some of the Sylvia's points. I think I would just like really echo personally, uh, you know, the the need to ensure that individuals are able to go back home really resonates with me. I think I, you know, like I, I'm back, I'm Slovenian, I'm back in Slovenia now, but, uh, you know, lived in Belgium, but lived in the UK, lived in the US for 10 years. And, and you know, simple things, ensuring that you are able to, um, you know, your degree is valid in the country, that, that you are able to get the pension, um, like you said, I think are, all super like seem very straightforward but are, are actually massive barriers for people for people to move back home so i would just wholeheart wholeheartedly agree from my own experience um in terms of the private sector uh responsibility responsibility um and role in capacity building i really would not uh look at it at all as a just a purse, which is a little bit how you uh, pointed that question. So I wouldn't let, just look at it as a financial resource. I would really uh, look at it at uh, more broader in terms of where the responsibility for the, the sector lie. And I think that also uh, for several reasons. I think the, you know, the, the private sector, the technology industry is not just large companies. It is, in fact, a majority small companies um, and in particular those that operate domestically in, in smaller environment in sort of not just transnationally but they operate in different countries around the world and implement a lot of the uh, a lot of the cyber security issues i think just don't necessarily have the resources um, but they are still an important partner and i think i would think about this from a perspective of 
the private sector is responsible for a lot of the cybersecurity issues. So there is a shared responsibility, and I think we need to acknowledge it. Uh, that means, you know, that is partly because um, we operate a lot of the technology. That also means that we often see both threats and low sort of trends, both long terms, both as well as sort of cross different countries and environments that not are not necessarily just, you know, Ethiopia or Zambia or Slovenia, but like across them. Um, and 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 they these can be really helpful inputs for defense. But I think the other thing as well, sort of kind of the converse of it. We see a lot of the, particularly the big multinational companies, see how countries are approaching cybersecurity resilience, capacity building, and can can sort of be a useful resource to be like, oh, you know, maybe someone else has tried this idea and it didn't work, and uh, or maybe someone else tried another idea and it worked really well. You know, obviously, always need to take the local context into account. But I think it's important to think about um, not reinventing the wheel in this area as well. And um, I think perhaps most importantly is, you, you know, we see we also see sort of the long term. Um, we drive and see a, a lot of the long term innovation in technology and sort of trends. So we are able to um, ahead of time perhaps help with the with predictions and in where investments would have to be have to be made um um sort of ac across a longer time scale um you know microsoft has tried and, and and done a lot of these things i think in particularly um over the last year uh, just because we talked about scaling a fair amount which is a really important aspect in addition to sort of creating the structures ensuring the technology is available um we've uh, we, we've invested substantially across 23 different countries uh, over the past year and we'll expand it to more um, in terms of our cybersecurity skilling campaign. And I will say it's also important, like I said earlier, it's important to think of us as a um, probably force multiplier is a good word or uh, some someone that can instigate more quickly a particular process. So for instance, for we in the US, we worked with community colleges to sort of really, and really with a real focus on bringing in um, diverse communities, you know, whether it's communities of color, whether it's communities, um, whether it's women, just people from disadvantaged background overall, that, in Colombia, we're doing something completely different. In India, we're doing something completely different. So figuring out how, um, you know, how, whether you can partner with someone like that to just kickstart something and 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 sort of then be able to build on it. I think that's weird. Industry can play a good role as well. And then obviously some of our some of it is just making sure that we do um, you know keep our own house in order, but also make sure we make available tests, courses, um, and um, not just for people who want to learn, but also for, for educators, for teachers, um, that uh, they get to understand, how the, they, they get the skills that are the most useful on, uh, in our case, the Microsoft platform. So, you know, earlier was mentioned a lot of times, uh, people go to, go to schools and don't necessarily um, gather the, the skills that are required. Hopefully, you know, our own effort to try and educate, raise awareness of what can be do, done and what should be done on cybersecurity when it comes to our own systems and make this freely available is a small contribution towards, uh, you know, making sure that when people take the course, they get the certificate, um, they can then um, also get a job. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I like the bit about the varied approach that uh, Microsoft has to different countries. But just, uh, Kaya, just before I, uh, we let you go a little bit there, um, is, is it possible if you could just elaborate on the, uh, just the private sector's role beyond 
sales opportunities, especially when you look at the global uh, level, especially when you have uh, demand and supply and uh, bigger companies taking more of the share. Uh, what's your comment on that, please? I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, to be entirely. You know, like, I, I think a little bit, like I said, um, the, you know, the role is as a, an operator of technology, as a, um, as, as, uh, you know, like effectively, you know, uh, effectively as um, the, 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 I'm not going to say the main, but because I feel like that's a lot from, from a Microsoft perspective, but I think, you know, provider of services uh, when it comes to, you know, whether it's critical infrastructure, whether it's schools, whether it's, um, whether it's other, whether it's just, you know, conferences like this. Um, so I think the, as, as sort of in that role, um, the companies need to ensure that they, what they're doing, they're doing securely. Um, but, um, and, uh, but, but I, I hope this answers your questions, but yes. I wasn't entirely sure about the sales angle. No, you've done very well. You actually answered it. Thank you so much. Um, of course, uh, moving on to, from the private sector, there's also the component about the knowledge, knowledge level, uh, from the university, Andrea, I know you are a university person, uh, you've worked in capacity building. Uh, what's your take in terms of the concept of capacity building, especially from an academic, uh, of your stature? Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for loading me with such a responsibility to represent the, the academic community. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I promise that. Um, but um, uh, it's a t thank you also for the very timely questions. I mean, uh, uh, whether the concept of capacity building has changed over the last years. It's timely because uh, even in these days, over the last three days here at the IGF, uh, I was happy to hear many uh, successful stories about cyber capacity building initiatives, panels that might have taken capacity building from uh, also from slightly different perspectives. And um, and as a kind of a good way to celebrate uh, the many achievements uh, over that we get over the la got o over the last uh, years, but uh, as being a moment for for celebration is also a moment that gives us the opportunity to reflect on what can be done even better, or what uh, uh, we still needs to be done. And uh, and uh, the so you ask whether the concept of capacity building has changed over the last years. Uh, I actually wonder myself whether it has changed at all. And uh, my straightforward answer is probably not, or probably not enough. Uh, priorities has changed, rightfully. I think uh, moving back to the to the to the celebration somehow, uh, it's true that over the last years, uh, cyber capacity building is now at the center of uh, um, international cooperation agenda. Something that was not the case until a few years ago. Um, now many uh, support a lot of support uh, to countries, state actors, to build their own. Uh, establishing a computer emergency response team, national drafting national cybersecurity strategies, that happened. And in the recent, even more recent years, uh, we uh, start talking, actually more than start talking, implementing kind of cyber diplomacy capacity, which is another crucial component of capacity building, empowering countries to engage in this growing international cooperation in the cyber domain. This is a uh, going pretty well, but uh, I think this is really not enough. So we really need to go beyond that. I mean, Kaya also was mentioning, it's something that we all agree, that uh, the protection of the cyber domain is a shared responsibility. Uh, and uh, it's that's become a mantra. Uh, is a shared responsibility between state actors, civil society, industry. But in to make this real, I think this panel is called to make capacity building real, then we need kind of translate this mantra into concrete initiatives and still there are still needs uh, many things that needs to be done in this direction how to do that the probably we need to broaden up the concept of capacity building we need to uh, move on beyond the state uh, cybersecurity capacity we need to clearly engage more with uh, uh, initiatives that build capacities of industry and of course I'm not talking Microsoft there's a lot of capacities but I'm talking about the local industry that uh, needs a lot of support in uh, building capacity, not only their capacity now to manage the little industry, but also capacity to engage with other stakeholders. This is, a, in my experience, uh, is what is uh, often lacking. And of course, the civil so as an academic, I represent civil society, and uh, um, there is a lot of capacity that needs to be developed there. And I'm not talking about the capacity that we talk a lot about uh, uh, developing cyber hygiene norms, 
still very crucial, but that's not enough to empower civil society to take uh, an active role in this uh, uh, multi-stakeholder approach to, to, to uh, on, on cyber security. How to do that again? Um, well, you, it's been mentioned actually, and it's been mentioned, I think, uh, um, Kerry mentioned that, uh, that uh, the, 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 the it's been identified as a gap, a uh, knowledge gap. And uh, being a member of academia, uh, I strongly believe in the role of uh, science, uh, of uh, knowledge production in uh, feeding policy making processes. And this, this is already happening, but this uh, knowledge comes always, most of the times uh, from, uh, from outside countries, contexts. And, uh, and, uh, and this means that we rather need to invest more in developing, of course, training, master, PhD programs, but research. So and this means, of course, to work more, more with uh, academic communities in countries. Also, because when uh, academic community will start to, uh, to develop the knowledge that is required to build this national cyber capacity at that point, it's going to be a really bottom-up approach. And that, that countries, that context will, will take a stand on with uh, its own feet. Uh, thank you so much, Andrea. I think there are things that you mentioned there, two things. One is the multi-stakeholder approach to capacity building. Uh, and you've also mentioned about the local, going to the local level in order to build the capacity. Uh, are you seeing that as a trend, especially in communities where they can build the capacity within communities? Or do you see going to the local level, meaning making sure that it's understandable at the local level? Well, as I mentioned, um, okay, make another comparison. A few years ago, it was, and I remember the meeting we had here at the African Union uh, was three years ago. I think uh, it was a uh, few years ago, it was already difficult to engage with state actors. Uh, it was uh, difficult to put cyber capacity in building at the center of the national agenda, uh, top of their priorities. And uh, I think we are, again, in a, at, at the moment where that's been done. And uh, we need to uh, engage more with other actors in order to convince them that buildings on how important is their role in uh, is active role in contributing to the to cyber uh, national cyber security framework. So this is uh, clearly something that needs to be done with our other tools. I mean, of course, uh, building connection with the university is one of the way to do that. And um, but also important to a way to know they need to engage with each other and not work in silos because this is what often happens. Industry does industry, civil society does other stuff. It's the cooperation is always very important. Yeah, thanks so much for that because I think in many countries, uh, some countries have very good organized structures where they bring all the civil society, the government departments and so forth. But I think you're right. There has to be some synergy between those kind of silos so that you can get each of the points going. I know we do have our online questions that are being asked. I want just want to make sure that we, our moderators who are looking online, just make sure that you can let us know if there are specific questions happening. I just wanted to go back to Sylvia, if you, Sylvia, I don't know whether you're still there. Still here. Oh, thank you so much. I know we are, you're, you're just about to go to sleep, but I just wanted to catch your view on the issue about uh, the, the, the approach, the neutral approach to capacity building. I know you're, you're a big advocate for that. So if you can give mm -hmm. us your perspective of that and uh, what do you see as the pitfalls of that or is it the way to go? Yeah, um, well, I, I think that um, some of the other uh, panelists have, have mentioned a couple of things that are, uh, I would like to, to um, kind of piggyback on, on that and highlight also about the importance of collaboration and um, collaboration that, that is uh, meaningful and is practical. So trying to identify in what areas a particular organization is strong so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, as, as Kaya mentioned uh, before, I think is, is super important in looking at really concrete operational benefits of those collaborations are, are is something that is, is really uh, important. Either, I mean, could be, uh, just to give you an example, we are doing um, a really interesting project to increase capacity and visibility for women and LGBTQI uh, technical members uh, of the staff of organizations in Asia, in Southeast Asia that are working on national operations and security. And um, one of the, the, 
the more important uh, aspects of this project is to uh, has been to identify the vast uh, number and the 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 the, 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 the breadth of um, uh, manuals, courses, webinars, experts that are out there, and and how they are ranked or valued in terms of the professional certifications that uh, someone can achieve with them to identify which of those providers is the one that will give them more bang for their buck, would say. So we, we are, and in this project, we've been working with over 50 uh, training providers in the region, many uh, in different languages. And it's this kind of discovery that the APNIC Academy and the APNIC um, uh, trainers don't need to know everything and they don't need to give all the courses and learn and how to deliver those courses in all of those languages, but they can help identify what are the needs for the person that is looking at uh, improving their capacity, where do they um, have access to that um, uh, learning, and what is the best certificate uh, that they can achieve that you know will put them in the right um, uh, track. Because if, if the certification doesn't allow for them to have operational experience, then it's again that gap between being very theoretical and not having operational experience, which is super important. And I think that is one of the biggest assets that collaborating with the private sector can bring, and is that uh, the private sector can really welcome uh, placements, um, support fellowships, internships to allow people, not only from developing countries, but people that are acquiring high level skills to put them into practice in a, in a, in a safe way with mentors and assistance and support so that whenever they go back to um, their countries of origin, they can de deploy those skills in, a, in an appropriate uh, manner without compromising anything that is already um, you know, in use uh, for the infrastructure of that particular uh, economy. I think that um, going back to the, the your question about sure. the neutrality, um, APNIC is uh, a, a strong advocate uh, to, you know, that the internet is for everyone and that um, it is very important that uh, we support an internet for all. It doesn't matter who is in power and what's going on in politics. Um, etc. But I don't think um, the organizations in the region or anywhere in the world, uh, we can't be uh, blind to the situations that are uh, happening um, around the, the different regions. Uh, of course, the war in Ukraine is something that we, you know, is front and center for, for many uh, people every time we open the, the, the news and we, we see what's going on and, and we you know, worried about the, the future. But I, I think that the skills that many people are learning in the areas of network operations and security are critical for the for peace and reconstruction and for stability. Yeah. And it's very important that the network engineers that are putting that expertise in use understand the power that they have for a for a piece for peace to actually you know deliver and for benefits uh, around their livelihoods to deliver for every single person in the planet yes. so we need to um you know a lot of the people that are working in this space um do not uh, see themselves as political animals right and okay. many of the technical voices um, that do not come to the IGF, for example, because they think it's too much politics um, in the conversations. Um, we need to encourage these folks to come to the IGF, to, uh, the regional IGFs, to sure. the national IGFs, to other spaces where the multi-stakeholder uh, collaboration and discussions will allow them to understand um, the importance of the whole. That is not only that little piece of code that they are working on or that little device they need, uh, they are taking care of or that cable that they are laying out is, is how it all interconnects and that, that they are part of what the internet can or cannot uh, 
facilitate for people in a particular okay. uh, place. Okay. And we are, we are what we build, so, right? So so if, uh, if we are, um, sorry, if we are, if we are just um, a tools of of uh, aggression and how um, the expertise in security can be used, um, sure. then we are defeating the, the the purpose of just making an internet for all. I hope thank that you. I, I'm, I'm sorry if it was too long, but uh, thank you very much for letting me put my two uh, grains of sand here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Sylvia. You're just about to get a red card, but that's good. So now um, we've, we've heard about the perspective from the panelists. Uh, I made sure that we have some space for time or time for questions. So uh, most of the panelists have actually looked at specific issues. Uh, Sylvia has given us a lot of perspective, especially from APNIC's uh, experiences uh, in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, Jacqueline gave us a perspective of the clearinghouse. Uh, Kerian, of course, gave us a very, very interesting perspective of the study that they've done and also the Latin American, the Caribbean region in terms of the dynamics that are in that region. And of course, Kaya looked very carefully in terms of what Microsoft are doing in 23 countries and some of the aspects they're considering. And of course, Andrea looked at the academic angle of cyber capacity building. And I think the multi-stakeholder approach was given a lot of emphasis. With those few areas that we've just covered, I just wanted to leave this space here for some questions. We know that there are no questions online. I've just been informed. So if you can have the mic uh, somewhere roving around yourself. I don't know whether you have a mic there. OK, so we'll take a question from you. Is that all right? Oh, from uh, that's right. OK, there's a mic there for you. OK. Please, if you can say who you are and organization, please. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for the panelists and uh, for uh, for everything you said. It is uh, very important. Uh, but I understood that you are um, uh, speaking more about capacity building for uh, decision makers, for uh, project holders, etc. I I confirm that those people need capacity building. Uh, for a, 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 a safe a cyber security because I know more um, a lot of them who don't care who don't uh, who are even not aware of the threat but um, what about capacity building at the grassroots level especially with the new technologies uh, everyone will be uh, confronted with this kind of threats this kind kind of risk and um, I think that we have to uh, perhaps address uh, capacity building at large uh, for uh, cyber security, for safe cyber security, uh, cyber cyberspace, excuse me. Okay, that's a question for the panelists and then we can take uh, maybe one more and then we can come back for, we can take three more. Yeah, okay, that's good. So the panelists, please note that one, capacity building at the grassroots, that's an issue. At the end there, please. The lady at the end there. Thank you. Thank you very much. My name is Judy Okite, Kenya ICT Action Network, KICTNET. Um, I'm interested to know about um, the type of courses that you have, whether they are accessible. And by accessible, I mean if someone was using a screen reader, can they be able to access your content? Thank you. That's a good question. A question on how we can be able to access content. I'm sure Kaya and probably somebody in the panel will be able to answer that. And we also welcome s any person in the audience to give us more information. Uh -huh. Which is the other question? There. That one, and then the gentleman at the back. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for this uh, great discussion. I want to know uh, towards uh, cyber journey, what are uh, those challenges that you find moving from country to country? S sorry, if you could hold the microphone close to you. What, what the Go ahead again. Okay. Uh, towards cyber journey, what are the challenges that you face moving from country to another? Okay, that's a question. Towards the cyber journey, what sort of challenges do you get from one country to the other? Is that with respect to how the country's maturity in cybersecurity is? Is that the way you're asking that? Okay, that's a question again for the panel. Um, the gentleman at the back, and then we could pause for the panel to take those questions. Go ahead. Hello. Uh, Talofalova. Uh, 
Joe Benz from Samoa. Hi, Sylvia. I hope the AP team are doing well. Um, there's a few things I jotted down. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Sylvia's presentation about brain drain. Um, I think it's a stigma that we need to change. Um, I myself is a successful story uh, from the Pacific. Uh, AP Nick came in. That's the first time I've heard of this term, cybersecurity. Um, th that's where my journey started. And then coming later on, I was part of the scoping mission for our government. Um, then we helped formulate cybersecurity strategies and uh, uh, enforcement of our um, SAM cert, our uh, computer emergency response team. Um, and then now I've moved to the private sector. Um, I've started my own business and we specialize in cybersecurity. So in terms of um, this uh, stigma, um, I think it needs to change. And especially for our region, the Pacific, we're very proud people and we tend to go back home. So um, getting educated is a good thing. And um, uh, there was a speaker on behalf of donors. Um, uh, there was, uh, somebody said there were overlapping projects. Um, I, just to comment on that, I hope the donors that are here, GFCE, APNIC, and all the other donors, they look into the Pacific. Um, it, mi it might be true for other regions, but we need as much funds that we can get um, for our little Pacific Islands. And one more thing, uh, Kaja? said something about the private se private businesses, private sector? Yeah, yeah Kaya, she talked yeah. about private sector. Yes, yes. so the, the, there's a she saying that she said, instigate more quickly. And I I think that's very true. That's what part of the reason why I moved to the private sector is that uh, our government was moving too slow. And I that's part of the reason why I moved out, did my own thing. Now I'm trying to implement cybersecurity. Um, yeah. Uh, I think that's it from things I've jotted down. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for sharing with us some experience. If I get it from you that if you like your country, that is a solution towards the brain drain. Is that what you're saying? If you like your country, so the countries have to be like, okay, fair enough. For the Pacific region, that's good. Oh, the pr okay, pride and li liking your country solves the brain drain. So panelists, we've got something on the issue about grassroots, there's the issue about access, there's the issue about the journey. So take it over, Andre. So I can answer only to two of the issues that emerged from, from the floor. Um, the grassroots, I, I mean, uh, that is exactly what I uh, try to emphasize with my, uh, in, in a few minutes, the need to create a grassroots uh, knowledge capacity to engage with uh, either with policy making process but also of course uh, technical uh, challenges uh, and uh, and uh, yeah or develop uh, also a, a local kind of uh, uh, industry that could take care of uh, cyber security that is uh, exactly what i refer to and um, engaging these actors needs to engage this is something that is is uh, super important um how to do that? I don't know whether you ask how to do that. I mean, uh, I've been discussing the role of, uh, of uh, academia, of research, and actually this connects really well with the question on brain draining uh, that I don't remember came from some, okay. Um, yes, the, the brain draining, yes, because in moment in which, when there is of course a, a reason to stay, I mean, Samoa, I've never been, so I'm sure it's a beautiful country, but there might be also, uh, other reasons to stay which are of course economically sustainable in uh, in many ways and that is of course possible only if the people don't ever need to go away by creating the infrastructure that make people staying and again university research etc the brain is, is the home of many brains and that's where they're supposed to stay thank you very much andrea for that uh, does any of the panelists want to take on the other issue of access and journey uh, on online. Uh, 
So maybe I'll talk just quickly to the accessibility question, just because I think that's the that's probably mo mostly directed at me. Um, I would say um, I think in in terms of um, I would say Microsoft has since 2016 made accessibility a priority. So in a lot of our products and services, you know, whether it's Teams, whether it's Stream, the sort of the video service, whether it's the the Word, PowerPoint, Excel, et cetera, documents, um, there they are accommodations that are available and we've made it part of the product development life cycle. So it is a priority, but I will not say all of the trainings are accessible. I think there still is a journey, um, but definitely a priority. And if there's anything, you know, if you um, explore them and you, you figure, if you find that some of them are not uh, please, please feel free to to email me, um, and we'll take a look at it. I'll put the email down in the chat. Thank you so much, Kaya, for that. Uh, there was also the issue around um, the issue around the cybersecurity journey. Um, you want to take that? I'd probably take that one if possible. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of the things that's important is a a term I've been trying to push a lot this year and to next year. It's intelligent capacity building. One of the things we have to recognize that there are certain common threads that will happen throughout all countries who are like basic, whether it be a Pacific Island or an island in the Caribbean, there are going to be some basic commonalities between them starting up basic capacity. So like recognizing that you have to be intelligent enough to realize that we have to raise awareness at a very early age, promote a career path in cybersecurity, ensuring that industry, which was going to vary from country to country, industry is connected to education and connected to governments to recognize that there needs to be that relationship. And I think actually looking at the supply and demand and making sure everybody's speaking the same language. So if it is that I'm hiring and my hiring requirements has these specific descriptions, but the degrees coming out of schools and even some of the certification programs describe it differently. Obviously when there's a job advertised, persons won't be able to actually apply for it. Um, in terms of the journey from country to country, I think also looking at the fact that some countries may actually emphasize certain job skills more than others because of either the industry or how industrialized the country is or how digitized the country is. So also recognizing that promoting career pathways within very specific lines of development of the country has to be tailored as well because i can't go to a country and be pushing a certain skill set in cyber if the technologies are not even available talking about 5g when the country is still using 3g and looking futuristically is one thing but actually recognizing that there are current gaps and i think the last thing i'd probably want to state about that is a continuous collection and evaluation of the labor market recognizing that each country will have very specific workforce data that's available and start tailoring capacity building and workforce generally in terms of development towards that. So I don't know if that helps answer the question. Or Silvio, I don't know if you want to add. Yeah, thank you so much. Does Thanks. that answer your question? Uh, does Silvio want Thanks, to add something? I... Yes, uh, well, I, I would like to, to uh, highlight something that you just said, Kerry, around the, the labor market inventory. One minute, one minute. Yes, okay. uh, because uh, there are no uh, inventories that tells us uh, exactly how many network engineers and cybersecurity professionals are needed. Um, the STEM careers are all bucketed in one go in the majority of countries. So trying to identify out of, out of the different kinds of engineering, what are we talking about, is quite difficult. Um, and on the, the note about um, capacity building for, uh, you know, at different levels, I think that the pathway is not only vertical, it, it also needs to be uh, horizontal. When you want to learn and expand knowledge on a particular subject so that you became, uh, can become more specialized. Okay. I think that there are way too many generalists, especially in developing countries, and that's where the, the challenge is to de deploy uh, new services where they lack the more um, high-level expertise. Thank you. So Thank I, you. I hope that is helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we are actually running out of time. Uh, I've just checked again. Uh, we don't have any question online. Uh, I know some of you might have some questions with you. Well, I would urge that you take the contacts of some of the speakers and you can be able to get in touch with them. Um, I know this is probably the last program for the day and everyone is a little bit tired. 
So what we'll do is, uh, with those few remarks from the speakers that we've had, especially from those of us who are online, uh, we've had quite a lot from Sylvia. And again, thank you very much, Sylvia, for staying up all this time. I think that part of the world <laughs> must be very late. And thank you also, Jacqueline, for giving us an insight on issues to do with the clearinghouse, which we learned from the GFCE, and how that clearinghouse works. Uh, and of course, Kerian gave us a very uh, insightful uh, aspects of issues, especially in the Latin America and the Caribbean region on the challenges when it comes to capacity building. And Kaya also gave us an aspect of the effort that Microsoft is making. And we also appreciate some of the work that they've done in the 23 countries that she talked about on different aspects of what Microsoft is doing in approaching capacity building. And of course, lastly, but not least, Andrea gave us a very, very good insightful uh, aspects from the academia and how we can do uh, capacity building from the grassroots, uh, building up, and also involving other stakeholders. With those few remarks, allow me to thank our panelists, and let's give them a hand of a clap, please. <laughs> thank you. I also want to thank the repertoire, uh, Elliot, and also we've had people behind the scene, especially Kathleen, who has been behind the scene trying to make sure that everything runs uh, smoothly. With those few remarks, I know I didn't tell you who I was at the beginning. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Martin Koyabe, and I was standing in for uh, Mario Bayen, who has just had another uh, ap appointment and therefore could not make this moderation. But thank you so much for giving me your time, and hope this has been helpful, and we'll see you at some point during this particular session. Thank you. Bye-bye.